I want to share a word with you this morning that, I, that is all about God's dreams in your heart. God's dreams in your heart. And before we get into the Word of God, I want to take you along with me to a very special area in the state of California in the U.S. This place is called Death Valley. And it's a very special, very unique place. It's one of the most hard, tough places actually on the face of the earth. Because in Death Valley, it's too hot for anything to live, and it's too dry for anything to grow. You might look at this and say, this is the, you know, one of the most horrible places on the face of the earth, really. But however, sometimes, very rarely, and only when the very unique weather conditions are coming together, rain clouds will actually come in above Death Valley and rain will pour down on this dry sand. And when that happens, do you know what happens then? You're supposed to say, no, let's do that again, Hillsong. <laughs> do you know what happens? No. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this happens. This whole barren desert is turned into a beautiful, colorful garden. And people from all over the world come to study this amazing phenomenon, this miracle of transformation. And people wonder, how in the world could that happen to what was just a desert? Well, the answer, my friend, is there were seeds in the ground. There were seeds in the ground. Now, you couldn't see these seeds because they hadn't been activated yet. So you could look at the Death Valley and say, by mistake, there are no seeds here. There's no hope here. This is an impossible task. But wherever there's he seeds, there is hope. And when the rain came and those seeds came alive, everything changes. Now, how does that relate to you and me? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if there are a lot of people in this church this morning with a Death Valley area in your life. We all go through that. And the Death Valley area might have been there for weeks or months and, or even years. It's an area that kind of screams out to you, this will never grow, this will never live, this will never be that beautiful, colorful garden. But, and, and your Death Valley might be your financial situation. I don't know. It might be your mental health. It might be even your relationship with the Lord it might feel like a Death Valley. But let me tell you, God brought me here this morning to tell you there are seeds in the ground of that Death Valley. And the rain is coming your way. The rain is coming your way. And when those seeds come alive, everything will change. Amen. And if you have a Death Valley situation in your life, you're in good company, my friend, because it seems like almost every single person that God called throughout the Bible had a Death Valley situation. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 1, God says to Jeremiah, come on, you're going to be a prophet for your nation. And Jeremiah says, I can't. I'm too young. I'm too experienced. There is a Death Valley situation here. In Luke chapter 1, God speaks to a girl called Mary, and he says, Hey, I want you to become the mother of my son. And she says, how can this be? I haven't been with a man. There is a Death Valley situation here. It looks impossible. In, in Exodus chapter 2, God speaks to Moses and said, I want you to speak my word to Pharaoh. And Moses says, I can't speak. You don't understand, God. There is a Death Valley situation here. But when the rain of the Spirit comes, everything changes. So if you brought your Bibles here this morning, I want us to read about one of these many people in the Old Testament that had a Death Valley situation in his life. Genesis chapter 17, from verse 4. God is speaking to a man called Abram. And his Death Valley situation is in regards to his infertility. He doesn't have any kids. And he's 75, and the odds are not improving by the years. And God comes to him, and let's look very closely at what God speaks over his life. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. 
Church, can we say it together? You will be the father. For I have made you a father. So what God is really saying is you will become what I've already made you. Ooh. You will be who you already are in my eyes. Because God knows what seeds are planted in your Death Valley area. And even though they might not have been activated yet, he knows that they are in there. Ephesians chapter 1 says, he called you and he chose you even before the foundations of the world. And because of that, he planted those seeds inside of your heart. And when it's due time, the rain will come and they will come alive. You will become who you already are. I'm not saying you can become anything. Some people think they can become anything. You can't. Some people think they can become singers and they shouldn't. I don't know if you uh, like have these talent shows over here, like Australia's Got Talent and The Voice and stuff like that. You see, some of those people come up so confident and they think I'm the greatest singer on the face of the planet. And then they open their mouth and we all go, Hoo -hoo. somebody should have told you. Your mother should have told you before you went on national television that maybe this is not your thing, you know. Maybe there's something else. You can't be anything, but you can become everything that God has already made you. You can become everything that God has already made you. And I love this so, so much. And that's why God speaks to a young boy called Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And all we know about this boy at that time was that he was a, a, a coward. He was hiding away from the enemies of Israel, the Midianites, and, and he was just kind of trying to save his own life. But when God encounters him, he doesn't say, hey, coward. He say, hey, mighty warrior. What is God doing here? We all see that's not the case. This teenager is anything but a mighty warrior. Still, God calls him that. So is God lying? Of course not. God is not a man that he could lie. But God is speaking to Gideon, not according to his present performance, but according to the seeds of a mighty warrior that God himself has planted inside this teenage heart. Amen? And this is exactly why God always calls and uses people who are a bit, ah, uh, a bit unlikely, you know, a bit surprising to this world. Because God isn't judging from the external perspective. God looks at the heart. And inside the heart is where the seeds are planted. Amen. I want to tell you a story about one of my church members back home. Um, I have to give you a bit of a context, even though I'm, I'm ashamed to, to tell you what I'm about to. But I have to. In my nation, Sweden, if a woman gets pregnant... They're going to do a test on her to find out if the baby she's expecting has got Down syndrome, okay? If it turns out that it does, 95% of these babies are aborted, which is a horrible thing. And also a terrible signal that my nation is sending out to the Down syndrome community, basically saying, you guys shouldn't even be here. It was a mistake that you were born. But let me tell you, Jesus loves these kids. <laughs> Jesus loves these kids. So as a church, we want to become a counter-culture force to, against the spirit of death. So we are currently running 11 Christian schools in our city. And two of these schools are for Down syndrome kids and kids with other special needs. And uh, a few years ago, one of these kids, an 11-year-old boy, he was doing what we call city training. That's where a teacher would take a kid and go down into the city center and then teach him or her how to cross a street, how to make a purchase in a store, basically how to get around in a modern city environment. So this 11-year-old boy is walking around with his teacher doing city training. And all of a sudden, as he crosses the big square that is the center of our city, he stops and he starts to sing at the top of his voice. Maybe in Sydney you do that all the time. In Sweden, not so much. 
This boy starts to sing a song that teachers never ever heard. He sings, he sings there's a tree in my garden that is a hundred years old. Please know what I'm quoting, I'm not singing. If there's one place I would not sing in the world, it's at Hillsong. So <laughs> you just get the quotes, people. There's a tree in my garden that is a hundred years old. And teacher just stands there watching him going, okay, sing your heart out. No problem. Within a minute, a woman comes up to the teacher crying. Tears are streaming down her face, pointing to the boy, asking, why is that boy singing that song? Teacher says, I have no idea. And then she tells a story. This woman had suffered from long-term serious depression for many, many months. She's run out of reasons to live and she was contemplating suicide. And that very morning, all alone in her apartment, she had prayed her very first prayer ever to God. Saying, God, if you're out there and if you do care for me, give me a sign of your existence and a sign that you care. Make me hear that song that I used to love when I was a little girl. A song about the tree in the garden that was a hundred years old. Within an hour, this woman passes the square. And when she passes by an 11-year-old boy with Down syndrome, he hears the voice of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Can we give a shout of joy to an amazing God and Savior? She got the sign that she was looking for and she gave her heart to Jesus right there on the square. And later when I met this boy and the teacher told me the story, she said, sing the song to pastor, sing the song. And he said, what song? He didn't know the song. He's never been able to sing it once since. But when that moment came and that song needed to be sung to save a life, he could sing it by the power of the Spirit. God is always going to use unexpected people. Unexpected people, amen? So, if God now is the one who plants the seeds in our hearts for various seasons, and he did that even before the foundation of the world, and God is also the one that brings the rain to stir and activate those seeds in, in due time, then what is our part to play? What, what do we bring, need to bring into the equation? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you two things that we need to bring into the equation for this process to be successful, for the seeds to come alive in their due time. And both these things has to do with our hearts. And that's why the Bible keeps speaking about our hearts. The word heart is the second most used in the Bible. Second only to the name of the Lord himself. Why is that? Because it's in your heart that the seeds are planted. It's in your heart that the dreams will lie until the rain comes to quick them and, and have them come alive. And the first thing that God requires from us for this process to be successful is a humble heart. A humble heart. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Have you, have you noticed that in the Bible, whenever there is a list of stuff that God hates, pride is number one. Sometimes I read this list and I go, really? Pride of number one? Out of all the horrible things that we're capable of, shouldn't pride be maybe seven or eight? But you know why God hates pride? Because pride will abort the growth process of the seeds planted in your heart. Because pride will try to tell you, I don't really need the rain. I can have these seeds come alive through my own strength, through my resources, through my education, through my money, through the amount of my Instagram followers, whatever you rely on, but it won't work. And that's why God will constantly work to have your heart humbled, humbled, humbled. So we're constantly reminded we need his spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by his spirit alone will the seeds come alive. And I love that. God has got so many ways of keeping us humble, right? Let me just give you really quickly three ways that he uses to keep our hearts humble and soft. Number one, he uses his word. 
Amen? I don't think I'm the only one who's ever opened your Bible and maybe you expected the arms of the Lord to reach out and give you a nice, comfortable hug. And instead, the hand of the Lord came out to slap you in the face. <laughs> you know, you read something that went, spoke straight into the area of weakness that you have in your life or the secret sin that you try to cover up. And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord came out there to break your pride and realize that I need him. I didn't just need him once, once way back when I gave my heart. I need him every single day. Amen. Secondly, God uses his spirit to keep us humble. When we do something that we shouldn't have done or say something that we shouldn't have said, and there's that like inner urging, say, no, that was wrong, calling you to repent and come back to a humble heart, a soft heart. But my friends, the way that God uses to humble us that we like the least is when he uses other people. <laughs> when he will send someone who doesn't know anything about the situation, but is sent by the Lord to say stuff or do stuff just to call us to repentance. Oh, we have a hard time dealing with that. Who are you to tell me blah, blah, blah? We go defensive immediately. And, but still, you know, all these things are happening so that the growth process will not be aborted, so that your heart will be soft and humble, so when the rain comes, the dreams will come alive inside of there. Let me tell you one thing that he used that third way to humble me, okay? Back home in Sweden, in our church, we have a project called the Euro Tour. That's every other year, our young people, uh, they, they prepare, they put together a big Jesus concert it's basically a 45-minute presentation of the gospel using music and drama and spoken word and multimedia and dance and theater and everything. And then we join up with churches all over Europe and we perform this concert outdoors in city centers all over Europe, presenting the gospel and making open altar calls right there in the city centers. So we've been doing this concert in London and in Venice and in uh, Vienna and Prague and Bratislava, Copenhagen, Stockholm, you name it. So uh, anyway, this, special, this specific year, we had already finished, almost finished, the kind of the tour plan for the upcoming Euro Tour. And all of a sudden, I hear there's a knock on my door. And I've been working with young people so long now, I can identify them by the way they knock on my office door. You know, old people like me, we will knock like this. Very respectful and polite. But if I hear this, there's a teenager on the outside. <laughs> and into my office comes this girl, 14-year-old girl from our youth ministry, and she's super excited. And she goes, Pastor Joachim. I'm too old to even do the gestures anymore. She's saying, Pastor Joachim, I got a great idea for the upcoming Euro Tour. Why don't we make a big fat Jesus concert at Disneyland Paris? And I, I smiled at her, this kind of smile. Because in the back of my head, I was thinking, little girl, all the things you do not know. Obviously, I mean, our concerts like Jesus in your face, Disneyland would never have that concert at their amusement park. There's no way. Of course, I didn't want to tell her to her face, so I said, wow, that's interesting. Now leave. And she said, oh, thanks for hearing me out, Pastor. And she left. And I have to be honest with you, that as she left, her idea was already down my mental bin, you know. I had no idea, no plan whatsoever on following up this idea. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Joachim, when did you become so proud as to not even consider if an idea is from me simply because the messenger is 14 years old? <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> and I repented and I pulled the idea up from the, my mental bin and I looked at it and said, what do I do with this? And the only thing I could think of was I, I, I could call Disneyland Paris. And I so did not want to call Disneyland Paris because I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. Because that's, but you see, that's the definition of pride right there. 
When you elevate your concern about what other people might think of you above your obedience to whatever the Spirit asks you to do, that's pride. So I called Disneyland Paris and I said, hello, <laughs> I'm a pastor from Sweden. And, and I tried to explain my, my reason for calling and as soon as they heard, they kind of put me on, oh, you need to speak to Pierre. You need to speak, you know, nobody wanted to deal with this situation. They just keep p passing me on to new people until I eventually arrived at the person that was lowest in the food chain, I guess, you know, had no one else to pass me on to. And she heard me out and said, she said, we never had a question like this before. I said, I'm, I'm happy to be the first. <laughs> and they said, well, well, we never had anything Christian at Disneyland. Well, happy to be the first to ask. And she said, okay, just send me the promo videos and we'll call you back. And it sounded like, yeah, we're totally not going to call you back, you idiot. So I sent the video promos, and, and that was all I could do, really. You know, after seven days, Disneyland called back. And they said, you know what, we never had anything Christian at Disney, but these promos are good. This is good stuff. So we called the board meeting. <laughs> and we decided to give you a chance. We're going to allow you 15 minutes on the smallest stage at Disney, the Winnie the Pooh stage. <laughs> and then she said this, and I'll never forget it. Are you okay with Winnie the Pooh from a Christian perspective? <laughs> and I said, oh, Christian loves Winnie the Pooh. We absolutely love him. For Christians, Jesus is here, but we need the booze right there, right there, right there. So we came to Disneyland Paris and we did a 15 minute concert on the Winnie the Pooh stage. And they loved it. And they said, next time you come, next time you come, we're gonna give you 30 minutes on the Buzz Lightyear stage. So we came. And we did 30 minutes on the Buzz Lightyear stage and they loved it. And they said, next time you come, we're going to give you the full 45 minute Jesus concert. So we came and we did a full 45 minute on main stage Disneyland. <laughs> and I, when I was standing there seeing my young people go wild and crazy for Jesus, and I saw all the thousands of people with Mickey Mouse ears that were listening. I thought to myself, thank God for a 14-year-old girl that God used to humble my heart so that the seemingly impossible seed can grow. Amen. Okay, number two, the second thing I want to leave you with here today. Things that God requires in order for the seeds to come alive and to grow into their full potential. We need an open heart. We need an open heart. Because sometimes the present size of your heart isn't big enough to contain the size of God's plans and dreams for you. So either the dreams has to shrink down or our hearts has to expand. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways. Your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, the process of a plant growing has not only to do with the potential of the seed, but with the size of the flower pot. Because you can take a seed, like an acorn, for example, with the potential to grow into a massive, beautiful, majestic oak tree. And you can plant that acorn in a small, tiny flower pot and it will grow and it will become a nice little plant. But it's going to be nowhere near its full potential. So let's make up our minds, Hillsong, that we will not limit God's big dreams due to the small size of our hearts. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So let's keep praying, God, expand my heart. Expand my heart. Expand my heart. As I spend time in your presence, as I read your word, as I confess your word, expand my heart so that it fits even the wildest, craziest, weirdest dreams that you have for me. Some of the seeds inside your heart has got 2024 written on them. 
Some of them has 2025, 2026. I don't know what they contain, but I know it's going to be big dreams. It's going to be big things. And, and can I tell you just one final story? Please say yes. I'm going to do it anyway, so it just feels so much better. <laughs> Just one way that, that I got to learn about this in a special way. Okay, so a few years ago, I took my core staff out on a cruise in Scandinavia in what we call the Baltic Sea. Now, a cruise in Scandinavia is very different from one in the Bahamas, okay? Scandinavia is cold. So there are basically two reasons why people go on cruises in Scandinavia. Either to buy a whole lot of tax-free liquor and get really drunk, or to use the great conference facilities on board. So we went for the second, just to underline, we were there for the second reason. So I took my course staff, we had a great cruise, we were, we were praying, we were you know, having a great time, we were strategizing, planning the year ahead of us, and everything was amazing. Then we had a coffee break. And I'll never forget this, I just took my empty coffee cup over to the coffee machine, and as I put it there, I had a brand new thought. And it came out of nowhere. And the thought was, could we rent this cruise ship? Could we rent like this entire thing? Could we fill it up with thousands of on fire Christian teenagers? Could we make a youth conference at sea? And then another voice in my other ear said, oh man, no. It's going to be way too expensive. It's never been done before. It's just a crazy, wild idea. Of course you can't. But then the first voice came back. And it said, remember Disneyland. <laughs> and I remember Disneyland. And I called the company of these cruise ships. said, can we rent one? Which one? The biggest and I told him what we're supposed to do. And you have to realize this is a secular country. This is an atheist country. Most people don't think that Christians exist in Sweden. And we wanted to prove them wrong. So I said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll send you an offer. They sent us an offer. I read it. It had way too many zeros at the end. <laughs> you know, this was money that I did not have. And even if I had them, it would be immoral to spend them on renting a cruise ship. But you know what? We kept praying. We kept confessing the word. God is the God of the impossible. We kept believing that if this is you, Lord, then we will not have this dream aborted because of the small size of our heart. So we just kept praying, kept believing, kept stretching our hearts, made sure we could see this thing take place on the inside of our hearts. And all of a sudden, we still don't know what happened. But all of a sudden, we got a new offer. And for some reason, this cruise line company came down on the price with almost 80%. And all of a sudden, this whole thing came within reach. So we rented the biggest cruise ship in Scandinavia and we brought on board thousands of teenagers and we turned the whole thing into a church for the glory of Jesus Christ. In one of the most secularistic nations in the world. This was all over national media. One paper wrote, maybe God is not dead after all. And I wish you would have been there to feel the presence of the Lord and to be part of this prophetic proclamation. But throughout this amazing cruise that we had that I will never ever forget, I remember that I could have missed this so easily simply by listening to that voice saying it's impossible, it can't be done, it's never been done before. Sometimes we just have to open up our hearts. Just one funny episode regarding this cruise. Obviously, when they build these cruise ships, they do so to evenly distribute the weight of the passengers. And so there will be like a theater up front and a theater in the back. There will be like a big restaurant to the left and one to the right so that the weight of the passengers will be evenly distributed for the balance of the cruise ship. Nobody told us about that. We just looked up the biggest place on the whole ship. 
which was the big theater in the back, right, right at the back of the ship. We jam-packed all the thousands of teenagers in there, and then we got the worship pumping, which meant that everyone started jumping up and down at the same time. The captain freaked out. He said, I've never experienced this in my life. The whole ship is doing this. And I thought to myself, I would have given anything to sit on an island in the archipelago and see the biggest cruise ship in Scandinavia pass by going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Can we shout for joy in the house of the Lord? He's got big dreams for you. He's got big plans for you. He got big dreams planted in the soil of your heart. And I just want to break this down to your reality right now. Maybe you're here and you have that death valley. Trust me, there are seeds planted even in the driest ground. And the rain is coming your way. And I do believe and I've been praying for just this minute that lies ahead of us for the grace of God to touch every single heart that needs encouragement. There are seeds in your death valley and all the dreams and the plans of God will come to pass. There are seeds planted in the heart of this church and the heart of this movement and the rain is on its way and I know the best is yet to come. There's a beautiful, amazing future and all we need to do is stay humble and all we need to do is make sure our hearts are wide open. So Hilson, would you just place your hand on your heart right now and let me just pray a final prayer for you before I hand over to, to Pastor Phil. Father, in Jesus' name, here we are, acknowledging that you have placed all these seeds, all these dreams in our hearts. And I pray for every single one who is presently experiencing a Death Valley situation. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name for the courage to dare to believe that those seeds are there and for the patient to wait for the reign of the Holy Spirit. Father, let us stay humble. And may we never abort the growth process by our pride. Father, have our hearts stay open, even for the big, the crazy, the new things, the, the big things that you have planted inside our hearts. And may we never reduce the growth process of the plants by using a too small of a flower pot. Father, I pray that every single one will remember that nothing is impossible for you and that every single one will remember Disneyland. <laughs> this I pray in Jesus' mighty name and all people said, Amen. Amen. Can we give some glory to Jesus? Thank you so much, Hilson. God bless you. Come on, can we, can we stand together? And uh, let's really thank Joachim. What an inspiring, encouraging message. Thank you so much. And I'm going to pray, so please don't leave us. I'm going to pray in just one moment, but I want these guys, J.D., just lead us in a song of worship. And I just believe that kind of word, that's a word in season. I believe there's a whole lot of seeds that have been planted. And we, we, we're like, God, we want your rain to fall. We want your rain to fall on our hearts, on our lives, on our church, so we can see these seeds germinate and grow and flourish become all that God's destined and planned for them to be. So why don't we take a moment to just worship Jesus, invite the rain of His Spirit just to fall in this place, and then we're going to pray together. All the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great.
Jesus, we just pray for your reign, the, the reign of your spirit to fall on the hearts of men and women, to fall on our church. Lord, that there will be new life. There will be beautiful new growth. Lord, that is what you have already planted. There's already the seeds. And Lord, we pray that as we, Lord, allow your spirit to move, as we allow your rain to fall, that we're going to see growth. We're going to see something beautiful, something new grow from your spirit coming alive in, in our hearts and across our church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, if that word really spoke to your heart, maybe you felt like there's seeds that are like, man, they've been lying dormant, and I needed that. I need the reign of God's Spirit to see that come alive. If that really spoke to you, yo, Kim, just come up. I just want you to pray over people. If that really spoke to you, just, just lift your hand. I want yo, Kim, to just come and pray, a, just a prayer over the hearts of people, just to seal something there and say, God, we're believing for those seeds to germinate new growth to come. Thank You, Lord. Father, we speak life into every single Death Valley situation. We speak and we say yes to all of Your dreams yes. and all of Your plans, Father, not for the glory of our name, but for the glory of the name of Jesus. Yes. The seeds You planted in our lives to change our future, but even more, Lord, the seeds You planted in us so that we can help someone else, so that we can minister to someone else, so that we can shine the light of Jesus to someone else. So Father, we pray in Jesus' name for every single seed to come alive in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, and I pray in Jesus' name also for all the seeds, the future seeds of this church and this whole movement, Father. I know in my heart the best is yet to come. There are new steps of faith. There are new mountains to climb. There are new miracles to be seen. There are new areas to step into. There are new victories to be won. And Father, we just rejoice in your, in your presence, Lord. You are the one who planted the seeds even before the foundation of the world. You are the one who sends the rain of your Spirit. And we say, yes, have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like everyone just one more time, just if we could bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, Joachim, and hearing at every location, just before we conclude the service, I love to pray with people who just say, you know what, Phil, I haven't been living for God, but I want to make that right today. Maybe at one point you were serving God, but you've gone from that place and just been living life your own way, and you, need to, you know you need to get back into right relationship with your heavenly Father. My friend, He loves you. He only wants the best for you. As we've heard from the message today, he, he wants to see the seeds that He's planted in you come alive. And really, that all begins when we open our hearts to Jesus, when we, we say to Him, forgive me. I need a brand new start with, with God. And it would be my privilege to pray a simple prayer with people right across this auditorium and wherever you're joining us online at one of our other locations, you're saying, you know what, that's me. I need to get things right with God today. To pray a prayer of surrender, a prayer inviting Jesus to come alive in my heart, to forgive me and give me a brand new start. And I believe that's exactly what He'll do. So if you want to be part of this prayer, be my privilege to pray with people all across the auditorium and wherever you're joining us. Here's what we're going to do with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm just going to count to three. And when I get to three, if you want to be part of this prayer, you just lift your hand wherever you are and I'll see it. Acknowledge it together. We'll pray right where you're at. God's going to meet you there. One, hey, He loves you. Two, have the courage to say yes to Him today. Three, just lift your hand wherever you are. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Beautiful. Hands being raised here and around the auditorium. There's others like that. You just lift your hand also. Say, that's me. That's me. God bless you. God bless you. See, hands raised around the place. God's speaking to the hearts of people. And if you're with us online and that's God speaking to your heart, let us know in the chat there. And if you're at one of our other locations, you just lift your hand also and say, that's me. That's me. You know God's speaking to your heart. Beautiful. Well, we're going to pray. If your hand's raised, I want you to pray this prayer after me. And as a church family, we're all going to pray it together. Just, just repeat this simple prayer uh, to, to, to the Lord after me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for everything he's done for me. And right now, I open my heart, my life, everything I am, and I give it to you. I thank you from this moment. I am forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm leaving the past behind and I'm walking forward into my future with Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior, as my friend. Amen. Come on, let's congratulate everybody. We prayed that prayer. Well done. And if you lifted your hand and you prayed that prayer, man, we believe in that decision so much. We'd love to give you a gift. It's a Bible just like this one I'm holding in my hand. And there'll be people having these available as you leave. You can grab one. It's a New Testament and uh, it's a New Living Translation, really easy one to read. And we'd love to give you that. Even if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one of these and they're available uh, as you leave at all our locations. And again, online, we'll get something to you if you let us know in the chat. uh, Because we just believe the Word of God is so foundational to helping our lives move forward. So come on, let's congratulate everybody one more time. Well done.